G'day, Raf here from Digital Autopilot. So I wanna take you through some of the top things that I like to look for um, in Google search and shopping campaigns. Some of the ideas will overlap both uh, styles of campaigns, but these are some of the common things that I guess when we are auditing accounts that, that are coming on board, these are some of the problem areas where either previous agencies or people who have been managing the accounts just have not been uh, managing properly or have not set it up properly. Um, and they're some of the biggest areas that you should make sure that your campaign has covered off. Um, if you've got somebody else managing those campaigns, then you should be asking them the question, what are they doing with that? How accurate is it? So, uh, so let's get started. So number one is conversion tracking. So conversion tracking is basically measuring uh, what action has been taken on the site from the traffic that you've been paying for in Google Ads or Google Shopping or whatever marketing you're doing. So from an e-commerce perspective, that's essentially uh, the, the revenue that you make on the site, so the sale that's made. So you wanna be able to track you know, a click, the traffic to an actual sale revenue at the end of the day so that you can actually make decisions um, on you know which products to focus on, which uh, locations to focus on, which you know all the different aspects, the different areas, segments of your campaign, so you can see which areas are actually performing really well, providing revenue, profit, and which ones are not, so that you can sort of you know stop your your focus and your your advertising budget on those areas. That's the beauty of. Um, of, of paid marketing that you can actually sort of have a lot of control over which areas you focus on. So for example, looking at this, uh, this account here, um, you can see that, you know, when we're looking at over, let's say a couple months period, you know, we can really see, you know, like which areas, which campaigns um, have been generating a lot of revenue. Um, if we wanted to, for example, compare it to a previous period, um, we would able to be able, we would be able to see where those areas of growth were, and we can see where there've been some improvements, where there've been some um, uh, decreases, and we can discuss it with the client, or we can discuss it amongst ourselves to make some strategic decisions. So, you know, it really it really does help. Um, let me just get rid of that comparison here. Um, so, firstly, you can see the revenue. Now, how do you set that up? That's obviously a technical question which is beyond the scope of this video, but it will depend on you know what sort of site are you with Shopify, WordPress, Big Commerce, something customized. So you'll there'll be a different process for each one. Shopify is very easy, WordPress is uh, WooCommerce is quite easy, and Big Commerce should probably also be quite easy as well, and as well as some others. But the main thing is is you want to get that tracking working so you can see which areas, which campaigns are generating revenue. Here we can also create columns, which ROAS stands for basically uh, the return on ad spend. So how much revenue are you getting versus the spend? So it's spent nearly 30K for this campaign. Um, it's generated over a million and a half dollars. So that's a 5,000, nearly a 5,400% return on ad spend. So yeah, as long as that's above what the client wants, then we're doing really well and you know we can keep pushing and making sure that campaigns are within the return on ad spend. Consider it you know, similar to a return on investment. And so sort of what metric you wanna aim for. Um, so that's you know the conversion tracking side of things. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else uh, on that side of things. You know, there's cost per conversions and all those other things. So you wanna make sure, because if you don't have this, you're essentially flying blind you know you we, we've seen accounts which don't have conversion tracking set up properly and well how can you strategically manage that account if if you don't know which areas are performing and which ones are underperforming if you're looking at a business you want to know which product lines are performing well which sales people are performing well on the floor so having all those metrics you know in in you know and so much easier in in the online world because you can measure that but you have to set it up properly another thing is uh, um, uh, it's not a major mistake but it's it's a best practice thing and that is a lot of uh, accounts that we see they import the Google Analytics revenue tracking into Google Ads, rather than setting it up so that it's Google Ads recording the 
uh, revenue figures, which is much more accurate. You, you get much more clarity um, in terms of the data rather than importing the data. For, even though it's a Google tool, you're still importing it from another uh, data center, so to speak. So it's always better to have your conversion tracking set up with, um, with, within the Google Ads portal. Okay, so that was number one, conversion tracking. The next thing that I'd like to look at, that I'm gonna to jump to, is negative keywords. So what are negative keywords? You, you might be familiar with it, and again, this applies both to search and, uh, and uh, shopping campaigns. They do behave a little bit differently. So search campaigns, you have positive keywords, so keywords that you tell Google that you wanna appear for. Uh, in shopping campaigns, it all comes from your feed. So Google then goes and finds uh, search queries that it thinks you are relevant for, okay? Which opens up a whole range of other questions because sometimes Google gets a little bit greedy and just tries to find, um, you know, traffic even if it's not that relevant. So here's a here's a classic case. Um, it's a shopping campaign. Um, you could probably tell by the types of search queries what they're selling, um, in cartridges and printers and things like that. But you can see here that Google, that over a course of time, have made their shopping ads appear for just searches such as just the letter C or the letter A or the letters CC. Um, obviously, those things are not relevant at all, but Google's charged the money for that, so we need to negative that out. So there are many instances like this where if you're not monitoring the search queries, and Google doesn't show all the types of search queries that, that come up, they show a proportion of it. Um, so, you, you, but you have to monitor this and keep it up to date and know, and, there's, and then there's also different types of match types as well, whether it's broad match, phrase match, exact, exact match. Um, again, that's beyond the scope of this video, um, but, you know, it's important to know the differences between that and to apply negative keywords effectively. Because in some cases, if I were to do the wrong match type and I wanted, let's say, just the word printer negative out of here, because I don't want to, I don't want these ads showing just for the word search printer. But if I do the wrong match type, it's going to cut out any searches that contain the word printer in it. So you have to be careful um, with that as well. So negative keywords, it can save you a lot of money. It can prevent you from uh, paying lots of money to Google for unnecessary searches that um, you don't want to appear for. So that's a very important area as well to look at. The next thing is uh, that's often done is that sometimes um, businesses focus on certain areas so or regions. Um, sometimes they focus on a whole country. But the beauty, again, of, of paid advertising is that you can really be quite targeted, you know, where you focus your ad. So in this case, we, you know, after auditing the account and, and they've got a limited budget, um, you know, we realized that, you know, the, the budget was being spread so thin, but they were trying to build it everybody across the USA, okay? So after auditing their account, we realized there are certain states, they just, the, the, the cost per conversion was just way too high, it wasn't profitable. So there was no point to focus on all the USA. And so we really picked you know, the top performing areas and focused their campaign on that. So that's location. You can even do things like bid adjustments. So if, if an area performs really well, you can tell Google, look, I wanna bid a certain percent higher um, than average, or you can even do bid reductions. So you might say, look, I want to focus on that area, but I want to bid as aggressively. So you can do bid reductions, or you can just keep things normal as well. Okay, so that's locations. That's another area where a lot of people sort of don't don't take too much notice of. The other thing is, is um, ad schedules. So let's jump across to that. So often when we audit accounts, go into new accounts, their ads are showing 24 seven and sometimes it just doesn't make sense because people are not buying, they're not shopping 24 seven, they're asleep or they're insomni insomniacs or they're you know, just wasting time. So it's better to spend your precious marketing dollars at times when people are really, I guess, in the market of making decisions. Now it might be that at 7.30 in the morning or seven o'clock in the morning, they might not be making the decision, but they could be researching over breakfast. And the same thing at the end of the night, they could be researching and discussing it with their partner or whoever it is or their friends. Um, but really, you know, you wanna make sure that you set up your ad schedule so that it's showing your ads and spending your budget at times that 
um, are going to give you best return on your investment. So it, ta- it, it it's worth spending a bit of time analyzing when your best performing times are and structuring an ad schedule that suits that. And again, similar like in the location targeting, you can do bid adjustments as well for times that are much more competitive. But just to give you a, some something anecdotal, sometimes you'll see in an e-commerce uh, account where between let's say 5 p.m. and 7 p.m traffic goes up and conversion rate goes down so the assumption there is is that often people are on their way home way home from work so it it might not be as relevant uh, in a world where there's lots of remote working such as during the uh, covid pandemic um, but things are opening up so people going back to the office again people are going to be on trains and public transport uh, to and from work so there are periods and you have to be careful of that know how to read the different trends that are going on that sometimes you might see traffic going up but conversion rates or you know going down or cost per conversions going up so you might say well look we'll reduce those bits those people are just browsing they're just wasting time they're tuning out so that's another area to look at is ad schedules now let's look into ad copy and it's going to give us a bit of a uh, window into google shopping ads as well so let's jump across to here so actually maybe this one might be better there's a few more search ads going on so what we can see here um, this is a search for Bluetooth headphones. Um, you've got your shopping ads on the side. Now, obviously, shopping ads are uh, much more attractive to the eye. They stand out because they're very visual, but it doesn't have a lot of ad copy, and you don't get to control the ad copy as much as what you do with search ads. So let's talk about search ads first. We'll come back to the shopping ads. So search ads, you can see here, like this one here, just takes up a huge amount of real estate, which is fantastic. That's what you want. You want to take up as much space as possible. How have they done that? Obviously, they're bidding quite high for the search term Bluetooth headphones, um, but they've also used as much of the ad uh, copy and the ad features within Google um, as possible. So they've got ratings in there. They've got site links. And not a, so often, sometimes we, we audit accounts with see accounts, they might be doing some site links, but they just put a title, they don't put a description. So where possible, put in, use both description lines, okay? Even if it means you're repeating some of the stuff in the ad, put it there because you can get more real estate and put as many search uh, site links as possible, maybe not as many as possible, but I'd say at least four or five um, so that it gives uh, Google some options to show. Now they won't always show the extra things uh, which are called ad extensions um, with within the search results at least they'll show the ad but then they may you want to give Google as much uh, as many options as possible to show as many things as possible for your ad so these are site links um, the other thing is um, you can have call outs that's extra little sort of unique selling points um, you can have your site linked with reviews that can automatically appear as well uh, what else is there so here you can see there's only one description line make sure you use both description line uh, fields when you're writing the ads okay there's other things such as phone numbers that can appear next to your ad. that's an ad extension you can have uh, structured snippets structured snippets are different sort of segments of topics where you can have, it could be brands for example it could be styles and then you have the, you list the different styles it could be price extensions where you can actually list um, extra bits of information so the more things that you give Google to show the more space your search ad can take up okay so it's also important if it's a type of product which people are not that familiar with sometimes search ads can perform really well because you can sort of communicate something emotional or something a bit more convincing whereas a shopping ad you just see the picture and maybe the title of the product but they might not know how it helps okay so there are different industries where that might be relevant there's there there's a uh, medical product uh, that we work with and you know if you just looked at the picture of it you wouldn't know what it was but in search ads you can sort of give a bit of a description as well so that's where it can help um, so those are the sort of top five areas that I'd say you need to look at in terms of your search ads there's obviously more um, but we don't want to make this too comprehensive obviously you can reach out to us ask us questions 
um, you know, as to what other areas or whatever specific areas you need help with. But those are uh, some of the, the top things to look at. So it's conversion tracking, making sure that it's set up correctly, it's tracking the values properly, it's it's set up within Google Ads so that you can measure performance, you've got negative keywords, so you're not wasting money and just throwing you know, uh, you know well-earned dollars um, Google's way for searches that are not relevant. You've got uh, location targeting, making sure that that's a, a, as accurate as possible. Custom ad schedule, so you're showing your ads at the times that make sense for you. And focusing on your ad copy, giving yourself the, the best opportunity to have the biggest bit of real estate on that search results page. Okay, so now we're going to move into shopping. Shopping can be a, a bit more of a technical setup because you don't write ads, you don't set up keywords either. What it is, it's based on a product feed, okay? That come, you can either set it up manually using Google Sheets or some other tools, or it can be directly fed from your uh, from your e-commerce store, such as Shopify, it can be automatically fed, but it, the feed needs to be created. Again, we're not gonna go into the details how to set that up. Um, or how to manage it, but just just the concept that because it's based on a feed, on that bit of information, so Google needs, I guess, the best information possible, the most accurate information possible, so it knows what your products are about and what searches to show for your products. So in the feed, make sure you're using you know, the, the best title possible. It needs to be a certain length. Make sure it's not too spammy and it just doesn't, you're not stuffing it with keywords. Give it a good, you know, let, let's just have a look here. So here, you know, I've searched Bluetooth headphones. It says new Apple AirPods Max, you know, space gray. That's a color. So it's got the brand name. It's got the type of product. It's got the color. That's fantastic. Kogan Pro Urban Wireless Headphones, Midnight Black, After Pain Zip Bay. So they're putting a bit more uh, salesy sort of gimmicky sort of things in their title there as well. But... At the end of the day, what you want to make sure is that it's got the relevant information that people are typing in. You know, maybe the brand name, the color, the size, the 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 product name, whatever it is you think is relevant. If it's if it's a if it's a certain type of jacket, make sure to put the brand name. Make sure if it's for men or for women's, and what color it is, what material it is, and things like that. So optimize your feed titles. If you do a Google search on optimizing product titles for, for, for shopping feeds, you'll get plenty of information there. Um, also, making sure that there's extra bits of information. There's a minimum uh, amount of information that you need in your shopping feeds, but there's extra things you can add in. So such as, you know, sales annotation. So you can see here that this says it's on sale. This one says it's price drop. So there are criteria there to make sure that you can have your sales annotations show but you've got also good uh, the the ratings reviews or seller review seller ratings appearing there so you can opt in for that get free delivery uh, displayed in there or anything you can do to to make it stand out um it's usually controlled from within the, within the google merchant center there's a section on on them in the menu uh under growth and then and then programs underneath there so have a look into that in more detail Another thing to, to make sure you're, you're doing in terms of your feed is making sure you're getting the best product image um, showing for that product. Um, look at the background. Obviously, it'll get disapproved if there's uh, graphic overlays on the product, um, but make sure it's a clear, you know, very, you know, nice image. Like this one here, like it's very hard to see, but these ones here stand out really well. These ones too. Um, I think are great. White background always works really well. Again, depends on the product, depends on the industry. But look at what some of the best players uh, are doing in the industry. Um, test your pricing as well. If you're not, you know, so fixated on the price and you just want to get traffic and only get results, Google Shopping, like any shopping platform, can be very, very price sensitive. Meaning it may, apples for apples, it may tend to favour products that are slightly cheaper and um, obviously something sells really well you know it'll like to show that as well if it's from a strong brand but you know sometimes test pricing uh, you know drop your prices by a certain percentage five percent or five dollars or whatever it is and see if that has any impact on traffic as well um, the next thing that I want to discuss is a real literally 
overnight game-changing strategy that not many people in the shopping space know. There are people that do know about it, but not many people research it or know how to set it up properly. But it is literally game-changing from what we've seen with clients that, that, are, that are already doing well, but have sort of like hit a ceiling. So I'm gonna explain the concept first, and then I'm gonna show you some of the results from one of the accounts. So because Google Shopping does not um, rely on keywords being put into the campaign, it relies on the feed. So it wants to find the searches for you. So you, you might think, well, I don't have any control over the searches. I'm just trusting Google to find what's most relevant. But there is a way that you can actually control the types of searches. So he, hear me out on this one. Try and, try and catch, uh, you know, follow me here. So what you could do is you could set up two or three shopping campaigns. One of the campaigns, now there's a setting, it might sound a bit technical, but you know if, if you're watching this and you've set up some campaigns, you should be able to figure it out. If not, obviously reach out to us, we can help you with that. But there are priority levels. So you can set a campaign, let's say you've got um, you know, 100 products, okay? And so you set up a shopping campaign, you set the priority level to high, you put your bids low. But in that campaign, you put certain key negative keywords, which are usually good. So let's say it's the brand name, let's say it's the color, let's say it's the size or the, the model number, whatever it is that you know cert that generally work really well. So you put those negative keywords in this campaign here. And again, you have to get the match type right. Um, and what that does is then it then means you, this campaign is really what you might call your your worst sellers or your catch-all campaign. And it's basically showing that first. And you're saying to Google, if it's a very generic search that doesn't relate very well to my product, show these ads. But again, because you've got re bids that are really low, you might even have a very small budget on this campaign. But it's like a, a fence or a filter for all the, I guess, more rubbish type key searches that Google wants to show your campaign for. And then what it does, because you've got the negative keywords at this level that are you know much more, that when it contains those words, it's more likely to sell, it then pushes it down to the next level. So let's say you had a second campaign and that's set at the medium priority with a much higher budget and maybe more aggressive bidding. So now you know all the searches that fall down into this campaign here have already been filtered here because you've got the brand name, the color, the size, the model number, whatever it is, telling, it, telling Google that this level, if it contains those words, push it down to this one. So that's where you say, oh, Great. So I only know I, I I'll know that the that the searches that appear for this campaign have to have those words that we set up here as negative keywords. And you can add another level. Sometimes we don't need to set up a third level, but it can be that you know maybe the company name added in or Australia or online or some other variant of the keyword might show that it has greater potential for sales. And you can do the same process again, and it pushes pushes those more refined searches down to this level. It's a bit hard to understand, I guess, if you're not used to managing shopping campaigns to how this flow works, but there is a way to do that. And you know, it doesn't work for every company. It works for many of them out there, as long as people are searching for brand name or product type or things like that, okay? And so just to show you some results. So this, this account here, so we've called it, let's say top of funnel and bottom of funnel. So we've got that first level, we've called top of funnel and this one here we've called bottom of funnel okay because they're more they're closer at the bottom of the funnel to come out with a sale and we can see here that when we started uh, implementing this in September so you see here that the top performing campaigns for those brands so in this case we made the negative keywords at the top of funnel for this brand and for that brand uh, we put the negative keywords at the in these campaigns and we made the budgets quite low as you can see there compared to the budgets here and also that we changed the bidding we made the bidding a little bit more aggressive here and less aggressive there but what you can see here is that these campaigns uh, you know compared to what so these were the original campaigns before where they didn't have any funnel whatsoever but they've spent less and they've made more money doubled their revenue in literally just over a month
okay? The return on ad spend has nearly tripled. In this case, it's nearly gone up eight times. That's 4,800% return on ad spend. This is 1,353% return on ad spend. The, when they came to us, they basically said, guys, don't change too much because sales have been really good. We've been able to literally hit it out of the park with this strategy, okay? Now, like I said, it doesn't work for every campaign. There are some industries where the search queries and the search variation is so broad that it's hard to get real trends. And in those cases, you have to find other ways. But in cases where people are definitely searching for brands or definitely searching for model numbers or colors or sizes or something you know, quite you know, as a common thread through campaigns, then they, this is when it can be a real game changer and you can get way more traffic that's relevant, you can spend less and you can make way more money. So that's some of the shop, you know, some of the, you know, uh, top areas to look at from a shopping campaign. There are other areas. I'm not trying to negate any of those other areas. I'm just trying to give you some, you know, you know real, a few things that you can focus on or ask questions about for your campaign. The question you might be asking is, well, okay, I've got an e-commerce campaign. I've tried a bit of search. I've tried a bit of shopping. Which one should I do? I can't give you a definite answer. It really depends on the product. You have to test out both. But what we've found in general um, is that, is that um, search campaigns will generally be more expensive on a cost per click basis and shopping campaigns will be cheaper. Now, it could be that Google is giving a bit of bias um, to that because it's getting all the different types of searches. But that's the common thing that we've found is that you know you search more expensive, shopping less expensive. And when done correctly, shopping campaigns usually usually will beat search campaigns quite significantly in terms of the return on ad spend and the efficiency so forth. So we would generally lead to shopping campaigns, but it's not always the case. Sometimes in search campaigns with certain product in, products or certain industries, you know, you get to control the message a lot more with search than you might with the shopping campaigns. But shopping with their, you know, the images and and uh, and other aspects can often work out well. What we've also found, and we haven't got any proof on this, but we've found um, in some cases when you run, if you just ran shopping, it might perform well. If you just ran search, it might perform okay. But when you run them both together. We find that shopping can improve and sometimes a search can improve as well. So if you run them both together, so if one of the channels isn't working so well, sometimes test it out for a little while and, and run them both at the same time. You might allocate less budget to the one that doesn't perform as well and more budget to the one that performs well. So that's something we have found uh, sometimes works as well. Again, we don't have any proof as to why that exactly is. It's sort of one of those things that you find through experience. So um, at the end of the day, um, you have to test things out. And um, what, one more thing I'd actually add as well is dynamic remarketing. Dynamic remarketing, you've probably seen it. That is where you know, you've know you searched for a product, you may have not bought it, um, but uh, you then go, search, you know, you get distracted and you, you, uh, you, you, you look at other sites and things like that, but then you see the product remarketed to you that you were exactly looking at. It might be in Google Ads, it might even be in Facebook, sorry, it might be on other sites, but from Google Ads, it might also be in Facebook as well. Obviously, check out um, on our site um, where Joel talks about. He actually, you know, walks through this whole sort of remarketing funnel that he got taken taken down with a coffee machine. Have a look at it on our website. We might even have a link to it um, somewhere below or to the side. Um, and you know, check it out, and you'll actually see that sort of dynamic remarketing in action. And um, you know, things to look at there is to really focus on your audience. You know, show the ads to people who you know added something to cart but they didn't buy, or people who viewed products. You know, or a certain amount of products are, and then you know, you show them those ads. So only show it to people who have demonstrated some interest uh, through the behaviour and engagement on your website. So that was the final thing. I know I threw that threw that in at the end, but um, at the end of the day, um, test things out, ask questions of the people who uh, are managing your accounts or of yourself or of the agency, or come back to us about some of these things that we spoke about today. I hope you got value out of it and uh, looking forward to speaking to you in future sessions. Thanks.